Okay, hello everyone, welcome back. Hope everyone had a good lunch. Looking. Not sure if everyone is back yet. Maybe you can show turn your cameras on so we can tell. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Okay, I think we have maybe a few panel members still missing. Maybe wait an additional five minutes, Ulrike, and have everybody turn on their calendars, uh, their cameras, or three minutes. <clears throat> Dr. Woodruff and Dr. Hertz-Pisciotto, I think are not back yet. Give it just another minute or two for everyone to be back. And I was saying, please, if you're a panel member, just if you could turn your camera on just so I can see who's all here. Thank you. We're just waiting on Dr. Hertz Picciotto. Dr. Hertz Picciotto. I think it's still missing. Well, maybe to give it a little bit of time, I noticed in the chat that there was a power outage. <laughs> um, at, um, and did somebody want to say something about that, one of the staff members? Sure, just mentioning that we actually had a two alarm fire at the local power substation, just yeah. a few blocks from here in downtown Sacramento. You may hear some sirens still at behind the Cali me PA headquarters at the building. Cali PA headquarters. Well, I think we can maybe um, go ahead and get started, even though I'm not sure. I don't think Dr. Hospitioto is back yet. I think it'd be best so to wait, agenda, wait for her. Put comments on the PFNA that will be limited to five minutes per speaker and uh, Dr. Martyr, can you maybe start showing the public comment housekeeping slide that shows the URL to the speaker request form? Okay. And as a reminder, I just wanted to let people know that if you would like to make a public, public comment, please go to the URL shown on the slide on the screen right now and fill out a speaker request card. Alternatively, you can also click on the Zoom webinar raise hand icon to indicate that you would like to speak. And just wanted to ask Julian if we have received any speaker request cards. We have not received any. Do we have any speaker request cards, Julian? Uh, no, we have not. I, can you hear me? We can hear you. Um, like you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Uh, Julian did mention that there were no uh, cards. Sounds like it might be Dr. Luderer is having technical issues with hearing. Because I could hear that. Speaker um, request cards. Then um, Elizabeth, are there any raised hands? There are no raised hands at this time. 
No, um, I cannot. I see in the chat that you're asking if I can hear you, and I cannot. All right. Headphones that speak might be better. Okay. Um, do we have any public comments? There are no speaker cards and currently no hands are raised, Dr. Litter. Okay, so we have no comments at all uh, at the moment. Okay, so I'm just since we've checked several times for public comments, then I guess I think we can close the public comment period. And we can move on to our committee discussion and the decision on PFNA and its SALT. Um, do any of the committee members, um, would any of the committee members like to um, comment uh, before the vote? Okay, I don't see any raised hands. All right. Then we'll, is everyone ready to vote? Okay, I see nodding heads, thumbs up. All right. So then I'm going to read the question before the committee. That is, has perfluoronanoic acid, PFNA, and its salts been clearly shown through scientifically valid testing according to generally accepted principles to cause male reproductive toxicity? And now I'm going to call each of your names and ask you to vote yes, no, or abstain on this question. And I'll go in alphabetical order. So Dr. Allard? Yes. Dr. Ayun Kim? No. Okay, Dr. Breton? Yes. Dr. Hurst Pizzioto? I think you're you're muted. muted. Still. Hmm. Yes. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Luter, I, I also vote yes. Dr. Nazmi. Yes. Dr. Pesso. No. Do, um, Dr. Woodruff. Yes. All right. So um, I have counted two no votes and uh, the remaining votes are yes. So that's six yes votes by my count. Anybody got a different count in the staff members who are also keeping track, I assume? <laughs> we, we count six as well. Okay, all right. So, um, so six or more yes votes are required to add a chemical to the list, and six is uh, six is because six is the majority of appointed members. So, um, so the result then is yes to to add PFNA. Uh, the panel votes as a majority to add PFNA to this list. Okay. Um, I, the next item is the consideration of PFDA, perfluorodecanoic acid, um, and its salts as known to the state to cause reproductive toxicity based on male reproductive toxicity again. So I would like to turn um, the floor over to Deputy Director for Scientific Programs, Vince Coliano, to begin. Thank you very much, Dr. Luderer. Uh, once again, to assist you, uh, we have summarized the scientific evidence that you will consider for PFDA. So I'll turn the screen over to Dr. Ma Martha Sandy to introduce the staff presentation. Thank you, Dr. Coliano. So perfluorodecanoic acid, or PFDA, was brought to the DART IC for consultation and prioritization last year in 2020. And this committee recommended that it be placed in the high priority group for future listing consideration. And we have selected PFDA and its salts for consideration for listing. And in March of 2021, OEA solicited from the public information relevant to the assessment of developmental and reproductive toxicity. No information was received on PFDA and its salts. 
OEA has focused its current review of PFD and its salts on evidence of male reproductive toxicity. As I mentioned earlier, this information is summarized in the hazard identification document released in October of 2021. The hazard identification materials and PFDA and its salts provided to the DART IC for your consideration include the hazard identification document, the references cited within it, and public comments received on the document. We will take a break partway through the staff presentation to provide the committee an opportunity to ask questions of clarification, just as we did with the previous item. And I will now ask Dr. Pancho Moran to begin the staff presentation. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Sami. Let's see. Okay, can you see the slide? Yes. So good afternoon. Uh, now, as uh, the introduction said, we are presenting a brief overview of the evidence on the male productive toxicity of PFDA and its salt. And here's the outline on the presentation on PFDA. It is uh, similar in structure to our earlier presentation on PFNA. PFDA is a perfluorinated organic compound with surfactant properties that belongs to a group of chemicals that are collectively called PFASs. The chemical structure of PFDA is shown on this slide. PFDA has a fully fluorinated 10 carbon chain. PFASs, including PFDA, has been used to make products resistant to stains, grease, soil, and water. PFDA has been found in cosmetic products, uh, no data were available on production of PFDA or on emissions. PFDA is a global pollutant of air, water, soil, and wildlife, and is persistent in the environment. Level of PFDA in California has been documented in several studies conducted between 2010 and 19 by biomonitoring California with high detection frequencies. Similar to what was presented for PFNA earlier today, we have conducted literature searches on the developmental and reproductive toxicity of PFDA and its salts. We use HAWK as a tool for multi-level screening of literature search results. Then we focus on literature relevant to male reproductive toxicity. This is a summary of the screening of DART literature for PFDA. The studies identified as providing general information on PFDA are shown here in the blue box, and the studies relevant to male reproductive toxicity are highlighted in the red box. PFDA is well absorbed, binds to certain proteins, and is widely distributed throughout the body. In humans, PFDA is found primarily in brain with lower levels in lungs and kidney. PFDA is also detected in semen, core serum, fetal tissues, and breast milk. PFDA is not known to be metabolized in animals or humans. And discretion is mainly through urine and feces with a small amount are found in nails and hair. The half-life for PFDA ranges from several years in humans to few month in rodents. Now, Dr. Lin Hong Lee will present data on animal studies. Thank you, Pancho. Uh, I will present an overview of the data available from whole animal studies on PFDA. This slide is the studies of PFDA relevant to male reproductive toxicity found through our literature search. There are studies in rats, mice, hamsters, guinea pigs, and zebrafish. The NTP study is part of a set of 28-day garbage study on seven different PFAS chemicals. In the case of a PFDA, adult uh, SD rats received FDA, PFDA by daily garbage at five doses ranging from 0.156 to 2.5 milligram per kilogram, as shown here in the first row of the table. All other studies shown in this table, which were in rats, mice, hamsters, and guinea pigs, used a single IP injection of a PFDA. And these doses were considerably higher than the daily doses administered in the NTP studies. 
In these single dose studies, the animals were sacrificed at varying days after the PFD injection, as shown on the last column in the table. Next. Reproductive organ weights were measured in several studies. In the NTP study in rats, reproductive organ weights were reported for the control and the three highest dose groups. Epididymal weight was reduced in a dose-dependent manner with statistically significant reduction at the two highest doses. Also in the NTP study, testes weight was significantly reduced at the highest dose. Reduced testes weight was also observed in rats treated with a single IP injection of 50 mg per kilogram PFDA in a study by Olsen and Anderson and at the highest dose in a study by Bokustav et al. In the study by Bokustav et al, reduced weights of seminal vesicles and ventral prostate were also found in rats in all three dose groups seven days after the PFDA injection. Next. In the studies in mice, hamster, and guinea pigs, the authors stated the tested weights were reduced, but the paper did not report the actual data on tested weights. Next. Histopathological evaluation in studies of rats, mice, hamsters, and guinea pigs were, were found. In the NTB study in adult rats, PFD caused the histopathological changes similar to those induced by PFNA, including interstitial cell atrophy, spermatid retention, germ cell degeneration, and epididymal lesions. The NTP report did not include any pictures to show PFD-induced histological changes in the testes of epididymis. As shown in this table, the incidence of interstitial tissue cell atrophy was significantly increased at two highest dose levels. Increased incidence of spermatid retention was also insignificantly increased at the highest dose. Four out of 10 animals in the highest dose group had germ cell degeneration and epididymal lesions, but the increase did not reach statistical significance. Germ cell degeneration was also observed in rats in the study by George and Anderson 16 days after the single IP injection. The red study by Bookstaff et al., which examined the testes seven days after the single IP injection, did not report any changes in the testes, but they did observe epithelial atrophy of the seminal vesicles in the high dose group epithelial atrophy of the ventral prostate in the mid and high dose groups. Next. Germ cell degeneration was also reported in hamsters 16 days after a single IP injection and in guinea pigs 14 days following a single IP injection. No testicular changes were reported in mice 28 days after a single dose. Photographs of histopathological changes in the test of hamsters were included in the study report. As shown on this slide, the left panel shows cross sections of seminiferous tubules with multiple layers of germ cells. The right panel shows seminiferous tubules from hamsters received a single IP injection of PFDA. You can see PFDA treatment caused the diminished layers of germ cells in the testes. Next. Sperm parameters were measured in the NTP study in rats in the control and the three highest dose groups. PFDA reduced the spermatid counts in the testes, but it was only statistically significant in the second highest dose group. Epididymal sperm count dose dependently with reduced with a significant reduction about 30% at the highest dose. Next. And finally, the NTP study found the PFD reduced serum testosterone level at the two highest doses. Reduced the serum levels of testosterone and dehydrotestosterone were also observed in red, 
by book staff at all following a single IP injection in the mid and high dose groups. In zebrafish, PFD exposure had no effect on testosterone levels, but altered ratios of E2 to T and E2 to 11 keto testosterone in the second highest dose group. There was no effect on LH levels in rats in the study by book staff at all. That concludes my presentation on PFDA. So Thank now uh, you have time for yes. questioning. Mm -hmm. Yep, yes, I was just about to say that. So Good. now <laughs> um, I will uh, ask the committee members if they have any clarifying questions um, regarding those two presentations. So again, um, you can raise your hands. Uh, on camera or using the raise hand. I see Dr. Woodruff. Hi, thanks. Um, I was just interested in the, you mentioned the structural, structural similarity to PFNA. And if you had looked at any uh, in silico studies that had compared the two chemicals. Thank you. Do you want, do you want, do you want yeah. to see something or you want to? I, I, I didn't look for that precisely, but we do have some in silico data that regarding the interaction with the hormone receptors. We will come later in the mechanistic section, but uh, I didn't have oh, Okay, to... that's fine. But... That's fine. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other raised hands from the panel members. So I think we can move on to the next staff presentation. Yes, and, uh, and that will be uh, Dr. Kim again, that who will discuss epidemiologic uh, studies of PFDA that examine male reproductive outcomes. Dr. Kim. Thank you. The PFDA studies are a subset of the PFNA studies, so the study designs are the same, and the same methodological issues mentioned for PFNA apply here as well. Also of note, within each of these studies, the PFDA serum and plasma concentrations were often lower than the PFNA concentrations. As in the HID, the findings I will report are statistically significant unless otherwise stated. Next slide, please. OEHA identified 11 studies that examined male reproductive outcomes in association with exposure to PFDA. These included the same outcomes as for PFNA. In the next few slides, I'll present the findings on indicators of reproductive function. Before I do that, I will briefly touch on the findings from the two studies that examine the effect of maternal PFDA exposure on the developmental landmark anogenital distance in male offspring. The findings were inconsistent with one study finding an increase and the other finding a decrease in anogenital distance. In the one study of prostate cancer, PFDA exposure above median was associated with a 40% increase in the odds of prostate cancer, which was not statistically significant. For men who had a close relative, such as a father or brother who had prostate cancer, the risk was greater with an odds ratio of 2.6. However, because blood samples were collected after the cancer diagnosis, the possibility of reverse causation could not be excluded. Next slide. Now I'll focus on outcomes of reproductive function, starting with reproductive hormones. Lower serum testosterone levels were associated with higher serum PFDA in a study of 13 to 15 year old boys. A non, excuse me, a non statistically significant association with lower testosterone was also observed in a study of young men being considered for military service with a median age of 19 years. In a study of men whose partners had tubal infertility, PFDA was non-statistically significantly associated with higher testosterone. No association was observed in another study. No consistent associations were seen with PFDA and other reproductive hormones or related proteins. Next slide. The study with the highest PFDA concentrations and variability reported a substantial and dose-dependent reduction in sperm concentration in the second and third tertiles, with a 24% reduction in the third tertile. A non-statistically significant reduction in sperm count was observed in the third tertile. The study also reported a non-significant decrease in the percentage of sperm with normal morphology in the second and third tertiles. 
Another study reported an increase in the percentage of morphologically normal sperm. Next slide. The largest study that looked at sperm motility by Pan et al reported decreases in the percent of progressively motile sperm and in straight line velocity. A non-statistically significant reduction in progressive motility was, also, was observed in another study as well. Sperm DNA integrity was examined in two studies. In the study by Pan et al, in which infertile men were overrepresented, both serum and semen PFDA were associated with increases in percentage of sperm with high DNA seenability. Semen PFDA was also associated with an increase in the DNA fragmentation index. Another study by Louis et al. reported no associations with these measures of sperm DNA integrity. In the one study to examine IB IVF outcomes, no associations with adverse effects were observed. I will now hand over the presentation to Dr. Moran. Okay, thank you, Alejandra. <clears throat> Um, so in this section, we will present again an overview of the mechanistic evidence on the effect of PFDA on the hypothalamus pituitary gonadal excess and the thyroid hormone. So effect on reproductive hormones in humans and whole animals were presented earlier regarding other endocrine effect of service in vivo. We have the PFDA upregulated transcription levels of the aromatase CYP19A gene in the gonads of male zebra fish. In vitro studies on PFDA exposures reported a decrease in aromatase activity of certain human placenta cordial carcinoma cell line. And in the studies in isolated rat related cells exposed in vitro, PFDA inhibit the ACG stimulated testosterone secretion. In MA10 cells, there was a concentration and time-dependent decrease in ACG-stimulated progesterone and decrease in prenorolone secretion in the absence of cytotoxicity. Also, a decrease in messenger and protein level of the mitochondrial translocatum protein, PSPO, was reported. PFDA had no effect on esterogenic acute regulatory protein, STAR, levels, P450 side change, cleavage activity, or mitochondrial integrity. In another mouse lady tumor cell line, progesterone production was decreased in a concentration dependent manner. And these effects were seen at lower doses than those that reduce mitochondrial membrane potential. In a human adrenocorticonal, adrenocortical carcinoma cell line, PFDA had no effect on estradiol or testosterone level or on the estradiol testosterone ratio. In the next three, sli in the next three slides, I will I will summarize PF PFDA's effect on the expression binding and or activity of HPG related hormone receptors. There was an increased expression of estrogen receptor alpha and beta in brain of male zebra fish. PFDA induced a con concentration dependent increase in plasma vitrogenin levels in male rainbow trout. In vitro, PFDA induced human estrogen receptor alpha gene reported activity by up to two and a half in a human emb embryonic kidney cell line. And in rainbow trout liver cytosols, PFDA has shown to competitively bind weakly to estrogen receptor alpha. In, in a human breast adenocarcinoma cell line, PFDA had no effect on estrogen receptor transactivation. In a different study in MBLN cells, PFDA was found to inhibit the estrogenic response to estradiol in a concentration-dependent manner. In another human breast adenocarcinoma cell line, MCF7 cells, co-treatment with estradiol and PFDA resulted in down-regulated expression of two estrogen-responsive genes. In a Chinese hamster's ovary cell line, PFDA had no androgen receptor agonistic activity, but, but PFDA did exhibit concentration-dependent antagonistic effect on dehydrotestosterone induced androgen receptor transactivation. In, silic in silico studies, uh, determ were determined that PFDA is predicted to bind at the active site of human, mouse, and child estrogen receptor alpha. Modelings also predict that PFDA can bind to the surface of the stradiol-activated form of the human estrogen receptor alpha. 
Now, Dr. Melissa Kander will summarize the data related to thyroid hormones. In the NTP28 drinking water rat study of PFDA, the lowest observed significant effect level for effects on outcomes of male reproductive toxicity was higher than the lowest observed significant effect level for thyroid outcomes, which in this case was uh, free T4 levels. Additional in vivo rat studies looked at thyroid outcomes following acute doses of PFDA, but did not also evaluate potential outcomes of male reproductive toxicity. Overall, single doses were uh, by the IP route were associated with reduced total free plus bound T3, T4, and RT3. The addition of supplemental T4 only partially restored total T4 in the animals that had also been given PSDA. A higher single dose of PSDA led to increased serum T3 and reduced T3 uptake by serum thyroid binding proteins. Uh, across several in vitro studies, PFDA decreased proliferation of T3-dependent rat pituitary GH3 cells with no increase in cytotoxicity. PFDA inhibited binding of labeled uh, T4 to human TTR and displaced labeled T4 from binding sites on rat serum albumin. And in silico molecular docking model found that PFDA fit into the binding pocket of TTR. And again, overall, these results tease a possible mechanistic relationship between uh, PFDA disruption of thyroid hormone function and a contribution to the observed male reproductive effects. And the available data, while consistent with such a relationship, could not establish a cause and effect relationship. So back to Dr. Moran. Good, thank you very much. So now in, in summary, we have the effect of PFDA on it, the HPG axis include altering hormone levels as reduced plasma testosterone and dehydrotestosterone and has no effect on LH levels in male rats. Increased plasma ratios of estradiol to testosterone and estradiol to 11 keto testosterone in several fish and decreased ACG stimulated pregnenolone, progesterone in mouse lady tumor cells and, and testosterone secretion in isolated rat lady cells. PFDA reduces the levels of messenger and protein for mitochondrial translocation protein, TSPO in vitro. Induces upregulation of aromatase in male several fish gonads and brain and decrease aromatase activity in vitro in the human placenta carcinoma cell line. PFDA interacts with estrogen receptor in fish and in vitro in multiple human cells line and with the androgen receptors in vitro. If PFDA affects gene expression of some hormone receptors such as increased brain estrogen receptor alpha and beta in several fish. PFDA interferes with hydrohormone binding, serum levels, and function. Now, Dr. Nicknam will present a summary of the key characteristics of male reproductive toxicants and endocrine disrupting chemical for PFNA. Good afternoon. Um, the cases shown here in bold are those for which there is applicable information from studies of PFDA and has already been presented by previous speakers. Next slide, please. And now this slide summarizes the animal and human data for PFDA. In rats exposed by the oral or IP routes, there were reductions in epididymal and testes weights. Reduction in seminal vesicles and ventral prostate weight were also seen in rats treated by the IP route. The NTP study found clear histopathological lesions in rats that are similar to those induced by PFNA. Changes were seen in the testes and epididymis, including interstitial cell atrophy, spermatid retention, germ cell degeneration, and other changes in rats. 
Germ cell degeneration was also reported in hamsters and guinea pigs treated by the IP route. These histopathological findings are consistent with the effects of PFDA on reduced organ weights, sperm count, and reduced serum testosterone levels in rats. In humans, a dose-dependent reduction in sperm concentration was observed in the study with the highest PFDA levels. Decreased serum testosterone levels were associated with higher PFDA concentrations in serum, plasma, or semen in studies of adolescents and younger men. Next slide, please. If you would like to see how the animal data for PFDA compares to that of PFNA, here is a table for comparison. There are a number of similarities and findings on organ weights, histopathology, sperm parameters, and testosterone levels. And this concludes our presentation on PFDA. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentations. Um, and now we have time for some more clarifying questions from committee members. So again, please raise your hands to indicate that um, Dr. Breton. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yes, I just had a question on that. I like that last table of comparisons, but I just wanted to clarify the, in the animal experiments, there are different animal experiments that did PFNA versus PFDA, right? Because like it, when we get to the epi studies, like a lot of them are actually the same study that look at both chemicals. So, but for the animals, because I just want, want a clarification that they're, they're different, right? Yes, they're, they're completely different studies different in the different animals. Studies and study designs. Well, no, but aren't, isn't the NTP studies all done because it's all in one report, right? So isn't it done? The NTP, you're correct, Dr. Woodward. Yes, yes. Okay. The NTP studies were, uh, they, they tested seven different PFASs, yes. And it's all reported in, in two different publications, yes. Thank you. Any other clarifying questions from panel members? Dr. hertz -Bizioto? Just on that very last thing about the, uh, the, the NTP, are, are, did they, they didn't dose them all simultaneously, like all of the chemicals simultaneously. They like did them sequentially or did one and then cleared the system and cleared them out. And what, what, uh... I, I, I believe they were done at, um, I don't know if they were done at the same time. They were, they're different experiments of testing and using different doses. And I'll, I'll turn to Dr. Lee if he recalls uh, if, if that information is in the document anymore in the, the NTP report. I think you just said is what I saw. And we don't know whether they did one experiment in October, another one in December. And but the, the designs for all the groups were very similar. Oh, I would say and beyond the animal doses, everything was almost identical. Yeah. But they were different. Different sets of animal. They were different, different sets, sets of, of animals. Between okay. Same species of animal, but in different groups. Yeah. Each chemical included multiple groups of animals. And there was a vehicle control group for each uh, mm -hmm. chemical. That's yeah. correct. Yes. So you can think of them as a set of uh, experiments, but they're each separate experiments. And uh, use, oh, go ahead. Using different dose levels. Different animals. And different animals, for sure. Yes. Okay. But the same species and strain. Correct. Yes. And I just want to say that um, looking at the PFDA, they're, while they're slightly different doses, the doses overlap, right, with the PFNA. So they have control. They both have 0 0.65, 1.25, and 2.5. Correct. Right. Okay. Right. Do we have any other clarifying questions from panel members? I'm not seeing any more raised hands at the moment. So then we can move on to committee discussion if there aren't any more clarifying questions. So 
Um, again, we're going to go through the, uh, the discussion of the different topic areas by the primary discussants, and then we'll have um, full committee discussion after that. So we'll start again with the epidemiology studies um, and start with Dr. hertz Pizioto. Sure. Am I muted? No, good. No. Okay. Uh, so just let me open up my notes here so I can see what I'm getting at here. So uh, I, I, I think that the, you know, as, as with the animal studies, there's a lot of similarity. Um, and in fact, in some cases, this, many cases, uh, the same uh, investigators looked at PFNA and PFDA and often PFOS and PFOA as well. Uh, and, and again, uh, similar kinds of findings. Um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the studies that looked at anogenital distance, uh, actually, I, I think I may have misreported it as being um, uh, for PFNA, but the, actually the results that had the opposite, the increase in, at the third quartile in anogenital distance was actually the PFDA and not, not the PFNA. So um, just a clarification on that. Uh, but again, it, the other, uh, uh, the, there's really essentially no data really on, on um, uh, AGD. Um, the, the more abundant literature again is in, um, in the uh, sperm quality. Uh, and hormones, and here, um, the, uh, uh, the there's a you know there are just a few really strong studies. I think again, it's the Pan study, the Qui study, and uh, the Ma study. Uh, I'll just say something about some of the other studies. Uh, uh, have uh, many of them have fairly null findings, uh, uh, including this study, the SPECT study, and there's a few others, uh, Toft also, uh, looking at this cohort in Ukraine, Greenland, and Poland um, that tended to have uh, not, much, uh, not, not much found at all. Um, and uh, those studies were not they were they were null studies, um, and they were they actually did a pretty good job of controlling for a lot of factors like um, you know BMI and age and um, you know self-reported genital and genital infections and testicular disorders and semen spillage and and a lot of other things. So um, they were uh, reasonable studies with 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 null findings. Um, and then the, when we come to the, the stronger studies, um, one of them, actually another strong, strong study I do want to mention is, is the, the one on the DNA methylation. Uh, and that study, um, actually, that's, uh, sorry, I, I thought that that had done PFDA, but I'm looking at it again, and it looks like um, that was, that was not true. Um, uh, so, yeah, that was that was just PFNA, as far as I can tell here. Um, okay, so then moving on to the three really uh, much stronger ones. Um, where is it? Okay. Um, and Lopez Espinosa, I also did not see a PFDA analysis in in that. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll go back and check again because I thought I uh, had seen that. Um, okay, scrolling down, pan, <laughs> here we go. So this is, uh, this one, uh, the PFDA, uh, why am I, any of my glasses or something, something I thought I saw yesterday and this morning um, is not showing PFDA. And I thought I just looked at that again. Uh, what is going on? One moment.
Well, um, Well, if you're having trouble finding your documents, would you like us to go on to Dr. Breton and then have? Well, actually, yeah, I did find it. So PFDA okay. actually does show very similar findings as the PFNA, um, which is that there's there's um, there seems to be increases in uh, both the the DNA fragmentation index and in the high uh, high DNA stainability um, findings. Uh, uh, not uh, nothing really significant in the um, concentration, uh, or but there is some trend towards um, the the um, decreased concentrations. And in fact, looking at the at the um, actual trends, um, the there actually do seem to be trends in the motility uh, that are very clear. Um, and in fact. Uh, and, and similarly for um, uh, the the yeah the motility and the DFI and HDS, so um, those uh, uh, do seem to be in showing up again um, a, a kind of consistent pattern in in that particular study. Um, the other uh, other study. My cursor here. Uh, it was the Quee study, and um, again, my notes. And when I'm looking at the, also the table from Oiha, uh, are a little less clear than I thought they were. <laughs> um, oh yeah, here it is. The P. Oh, that's also PFNA. That was looking at serum and and uh, sperm, sorry, I thought one of them was PFNA and one was PFDA. So maybe QUI did not do uh, the PFDA. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I can check that and, and actually maybe Carrie already has, has the answer to that as well. Um, And again, uh, Ma also, I'm not seeing PFDA in um, uh, except that it was highly correlated with PFNA. So um, I think there may be some issue of uh, being able to distinguish which which of those uh, actually was was playing a role. Okay. Uh, All right. Well, I, I'm um, I'm going to say that there's um, similar outcomes, and maybe a little less uh, actual epidemiologic data um, at hand to evaluate the PFDA. Um, and maybe Carrie can clarify because I'm actually a little little bit confused as to whether I misread some things when I was preparing my notes. Sure, I can I, I can go now, but I and I'll just I'll say sort of right now. I think um, you were right that Pan and Ma both did also look at PFDA, but I don't believe Qui did. So um so but they did see, but Pan and Ma both saw similar associations, as you said. So they found um, PFDA associated with several semen quality indicators, um, so low lower semen semen quality indicators and um and for Ma, it was lower sperm concentration. So, um, so yeah. So I'll just so I guess pick up and, and start with these and say um, there were four studies that looked at some aspects of semen quality, and I think um, all four of those showed some associations with generally poor semen quality. And this included the Pan and Ma studies that we just that I just mentioned. Um, and then two others. And I think of all the, um, the data that we have to work with, which in general is a slightly lower body of epi, epi work than for PFNA, um, but these four did find some fairly consistent associations with lower um, semen quality parameters. The other, um, 
the other associations with testosterone that were also looked at, um, I think there were five studies evaluated in this uh, with testosterone, and most of them did not find associations with testosterone. There was one that did, um, and this was um, by Zhao uh, at all at in 2016. And so, and this was um, a study that had about. So I should say all of these studies on average have sample sizes that range from 100 to 200 or 250 tops. So part of, I think, the problem with the epi literature is that they're generally small studies. Um, the Zhao study that showed an association had the highest, some of the highest PFAS levels, or sorry, PFDA levels. Um, and they, they comment in their discussion, actually, that in, compared to Americans, because this is a Taiwanese study, that they had much higher levels than Americans, than seen in Americans. Um, but uh, the, those effects were observed in adolescents. So they were 13 to 15 year old boys. Um, so the other studies, two of them were done by the same author, one in 2009 in a sample size that was only about 100. And it was so, their PFDA levels were so low um, that they actually couldn't even do the analyses complete, completely they went the way they wanted to. And so then they think a couple of years later, come back with a study that has higher uh, sample size of 250 instead and they start to see some non-significant associations with tes lower testosterone. But again, um, you know, and then the Moss study, which also had only about 100, uh, had no observed associations with testosterone. So um, I think suffice it to say, there's not a lot of evidence for testosterone at this point in the epi literature. I don't think that it means that there's not an association so much as we're probably not super well powered to be detecting some of these associations. So I would sort of leave it as the jury is still out from the, from the human literature. Um, so, and so, so I think the, the hormones and the um, semen quality were the, the two sets of data that, that we had, I think, a decent number of studies to at least start thinking about, uh, start evaluating. And as um, Dr. Hertz showed us said, the, uh, the anogenital distance ones, are, it's the same two studies that were also looked at the PFNA and that really have um, no, ev no evidence um that's compelling and then the cancer studies also don't there was really only one and I, th I think it was not um there was nothing much to show for that uh, so of all of the uh, of all of the outcomes I, I think that the um the data are most suggestive for for sperm quality uh, and that's all I think that's all I have thank you Dr. Breton. Um, next, we'll move on to the animal studies, um, starting with Dr. Ayung Kim. All right, so for the animal studies, um, so the NTP study, as mentioned before, it, uh, it is very similar to the study designed for PFNA um, in where they dosed um, different sets of animals. So it's a different sets of animals um, by oral gavage um, repeatedly for 28 days. Um, this is definitely the most robust studies of the set for uh, PFDA in the sense that it included uh, clinical, hormonal, and uh, histologic evaluation. Um, similar to PFNA, there was statistically significant and uh, decrease in body weight, testes, and epididymal weight. Um, testosterone concentrations are also decreased um, uh, starting at uh, 0 0.625 mix per kick per day. Um, and uh, they also had, uh, hold on, um, and then also um, epididymal weights and um, sperm counts were also low, statistically significantly lower starting at 1.25 mg per kg per day and, and, um, and went up to two, and was also um, uh, uh, lower in 2.5 mg per kg per day. Um, the remaining rodent studies that were treated or for PFDA were all acute um, studies where the animals received a single dose um, by IP injection and were evaluated for several days um, after exposure. Um, and so in these studies, I mean, there were really uh, a lot higher doses than what was studied in the NTP study, um, where the highest dose in the NTP study was 2.5 mg per kg per day. Um, they started out 50 mg per kg per day and went higher. Um, 
So in the single dose toxicity study, study published by Olson and Anderson, this was a 1983 study, uh, they were dosed with a single uh, dose level of 50 mg per kg per day. Um, and what they saw was a decrease in testes weight, and it was presumed to be due to tubular atrophy um, and continued to frank necrosis um, on day 16. And so the histo data was referenced uh, to another study where the rats were treated with 100 mg per kg per day. So it did not, the histo data was not actually in this particular study. Um, Similar in study designed to the Olson and Anderson paper, there's another study published by George and Anderson in 1986 that um, histopathology was conducted. And, um, and uh, the, the evaluation continued, um, or the animals were, had received a single dose and were sacrificed on days 4, 8, 12, 16, and 30, so over a period of time. Um, in the study, atrophy and degeneration of the seminiferous two bills were observed at day six and remained severe at day 30. Um, in the book staff study, they evaluated the effects of PFDA um, on the androgen status of sexually mature rats. Um, these uh, rats were treated with either 20, 40, or 80 mix per day PFDA, single dose by IP injection and evaluated for seven days. Um, the histologic evaluation um, indicated that the testes were normal and uh, 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 hold on. histopathological evaluation of the testes indicated that there was normal spermatogenesis and no histologic changes. So this differs from the Jordan Anderson paper that um, histologic changes were observed. Um, the difference was could potentially be the time frame of um, the evaluation being day seven versus day eight um, as what they postulated in the study. Um, and then also the strain of rat use was different. In the, the latter study, the book staff study, it was a Sprague Dolly rat. And then the previous paper was in Fisher 344 rats. So it could be a strain difference. Um, most likely, if, it, if anything, it may be a strain difference. Um, the remaining step. Uh, mammalian studies um, was published by a single lab, Van Rothlingham, in 1987, where acute toxicity studies were conducted in rats, rats, hamsters, guinea pigs, and mice. Um, these studies um, also had a single dose of PFDA um, by IP injection, and they were sacrificed um, sometime between two weeks or one month after treatment, depending on the, um, the species. And so Rats were treated with a single dose at a single dose level of 50 mg per kg and sacrificed on day 16. Hamsters were treated with um, 50 to 500 mg per kg um, per day, uh, mix per kg and sacrificed on day 16. And guinea pigs were treated from 125 to 175 mg per kg and sacrificed um, on day 14. And note in these studies, the number of animals in the Stud per each group um, ranged from three to five. Uh, it was for rats, it was five hamsters, it was four guinea pigs, it was three. Um, oh, and then for mice, it was 10 per group were treated with um, 150 to 250 mix per kg and sacrificed two weeks longer um, on day 28. And so um, the results were mixed in these species. Um, and uh, the rat results were similar to the George and Anderson paper discussed previously, um, where there's seminiferous tubal degeneration was observed in the surviving animals for the hamster, um, which was mid-dose 100 mix per kg, um, and the guinea pigs, which was at the mid-dose of 150 mix per kg, but not at the low or uh, surviving high dose in the guinea pig study. Um, and these were also to a lesser severity than that seen in rats. However, no histological testy effects were observed in the mice at any doses through day 28, um, but the paper indicated that there was slight reduction in testicular weight compared to the controls at day 28 in the mice. So some study details um, in the set of studies from, the, um, from this lab um, was not disclosed, um, calling into question the quality of the study. And then the last study was in, in zebrafish, and 
um, 10 eggs were exposed to a range of PFDA um, from um, well, 0 0.1 to 10 mix per liter uh, from uh, for one day post fertilization to 120 days post fertilization. Um, the fish were sampled from replicate tanks and um, and then essentially it was determined that um, um, significant there were significant increases in E2 um, testosterone ratios and E2 to 11 KT ratios in the male zebrafish um, with no effects on the plasma E2 testosterone or 11 KT um, levels. There were no studies available on the effects of PFDA on male fertility in the reproduction study. Um, and so that's it for the studies. And um, in general, the study, there was only one study of, of, of good quality, um, which was the NTP study. Um, the other studies I struggled with, again, because it was high, high, super high dose levels, um, even higher than what we uh, evaluated for the PFNA studies. And additionally, they were single dose studies um, and dose by IP injection, which um, can impact the pharmacokinetics of the, of the, um, of the compounds. So, um, so essentially uh, my conclusion again for um, PFDA is that there's no clear evidence that it is a reproductive toxicant based on the, um, the animal studies that um, we reviewed. Thank you, Dr. Young Kim. Um, Dr. Woodruff, would you like to comment on these animal studies? Yes, thank you. Thank you, the staff, for their summary, and Dr. Kim. I um, want to first start off by thanking the people who talked about the epidemiology studies and that they noted that, um, and I'm going to focus on semen quality because that seems to be the most responsive endpoint in the animal and the human studies, and that they noted that all four epidemiology studies showed association between PFDA with poor semen quality. I should have to go back and look at the papers, and that was uh, often in a dose response fashion. I also want to comment that PFDA is structurally very, you know, except pretty sim very similar kind of like uh, to PFNA, so we would expect similar types of effects, even though um, I agree, even though there's less high quality studies in the animal studies compared to um, what we had with PFNA. However, we only need one good high quality animal data to make a decision per the, the guidelines of, the, of what we, uh, for the committee. And the um, National Toxicology Program study is a reasonably high quality study. I just note that they evaluated multiple, as we discussed, multiple individual PFOS using the same experimental design but slightly different dose levels, same rats, same housing, same setup, but um, slightly different, uh, same type of rats, um, slightly different dosing regimes between the PFNA and the PFDA. And I wanted to comment on the, I agree that the IP studies were single, injections of very high exposure levels. So it's very difficult to conclude anything from those. But I just wanted to note that you did have an opportunity to look at the comparison of the different species to each other in the Van Raphael study, um, because they looked in the same experimental design, rats, hamsters, mice, and guinea pigs. And I think we see this commonly in, in studies in general that the mice look to be a little bit more sensitive to dosing um, than rats, hamsters, and uh, maybe the guinea pigs. So I think that's commonly seen in toxicological studies and um, something we should keep in mind when we're looking at the results from the rat studies for NTP, again, that, and that humans would be more sensitive than that. Um, so when you compare, since they used similar dosing regimes between the PFDA and the PFNA, um, when I compared the response, and I'm going to focus on the sperm quality because that is the one that's most consistent with the human findings. 
um, the spermatid heads, the epididymal sperm counts, and the epididymal sperm count. The, um, the, you can look at the 0, 0, 6.25, 1.25, 2.5. 2 we can take out those very high doses because, um, and just focus on the zero, the control 0 0.65, 1.25, and 2.5. And you can see actually a very similar response, dose response for those three sperm um, measurements between, for both PFDA, which we just um, decided was a male reproductive toxicant. I mean, PFNA, that's what we decided on, and the PFDA. And if you look at it, the responses are very, very similar in terms of a decline in those sperm metrics across the 0, 0, 0.25, 1.25, and 2.5 dose. Again, the way that the, um, uh, the analysis is done is that they do individual comparisons to the control, and there's not a evaluation of the trend like there would be in an, in an epidemiology study, though they do note. Um, so, but you can see a consistency between this and the epi study. So I agree with there's less evidence, but there's, um, in terms of studies that have been done, but the high quality studies are consistent in terms of effects on sperm with the human epidemiological evidence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Woodruff. Next, we're going to move on to discussion uh, of, of the mechanistic studies, and we'll start with uh, Dr. Allard. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have to admit that I did not really know where to start um, looking at PFDA compared to PFNA, at least. Uh, I did not really know what sort of endpoint to latch on to then look at the mechanistic basis for it. And I, you know, I didn't want to be biased by the HID document um, too much. So, um, you know, I, I sort of felt that the testosterone uh, endpoint was a little bit inconsistent across the studies. I had a hard time um, including all the IP uh, data that was generated in, in mouse studies because IP studies at a high level, uh, single injection, I, I did not want to lean on that kind of data. So, so that sort of, to me, at least left the field a little bit open. Um, as to what to look, what to look at. Um, also, uh, compared to, and I know this is not comparative, we're looking at them independently. Um, however, um, compared to PFNA, um, PFDA ha had um, uh, a less penetrant effect or less pronounced effect on the, the host of different enzymes that are important for, um, uh, for steroid hormone production. Uh, so they didn't see the same thing for example, with STAR, uh, no effect on STAR. However, there was some studies had an effect on TSPO, but TSPO in itself is kind of controversial in some sense. Um, the role of TSPO is still not actually uh, very, very clear. Um, so I could not necessarily lean on that either. Um, there seemed to be an effect on aromatase, but that as well seemed to be inconsistent across studies. So in the end, I was sort of left again to turn to ToxCast, which told me that there's not a lot of uh, in vitro, um, you know, like cellular assays uh, that are elicited um, by, by PFDA uh, below the lowest level of cytotoxicity, right? So the, the, what you would hope from those in vitro assays is that you detect something that's a clear signal that is way below or significantly below the, the cytotoxic level, you want to make sure that what you're looking at is indeed specific. Um, and again, we, we fall back onto the same receptor, FXR, as we, as we did for PFNA, uh, although the, the AC50 for PFDA was a lot higher. We're talking about, in this case, uh, uh, 500, I think it's 522, something, talking all this from memory, 522 nanomolar, yes, AC50, uh, uh, compared to, to PFNA, which was a lot lower. Um, um, and the magnitude of the effect was, not, um, of, yeah, of the effect was not even um, that strong, um, although it was actually a little bit stronger than, than PFNA. Um, so, so in the end, I actually had a hard time sort of coming up with a potential model of, ac of action for, uh, for PFDA. Um, you know, there, there's, some elements there, but just like I think we've already sort of heard from the 
from the human side and the animal studies side, I, I felt that once you sort of exclude the stuff, that's perhaps a little bit le low quality, um, which I, you know, um, I think we may have different metrics on, on sort of what, what a good high quality study looks like, but um, yeah, you, you're not actually left with much to, uh, from my perspective, to actually uh, draw a model of, of mechanism of action uh, for PFDA. So that's sort of unfortunately a little bit unsatisfactory, but that's what I'm, I'm left with in terms of concluding. Thank you, Dr. Allard. Um, Dr. Pessa, would you like to discuss sure. the mechanistic studies? Um, PFDA is a very different chemical from PFNA. Uh, they may look similar, but uh, the two additional carbons and two additional fluorines uh, increase the log P of uh, the decanoic uh, by tenfold. So its solubility properties are quite different. If you look at the uh, molecular area that the two additional fluorines contribute to the structure of the decanoic, it makes it a much bulkier molecule. Um, I'm rather uh, surprised that you can actually do studies at 50 or even 10 mix per kg. IP. Uh, my guess is that they put it either in oil or in tween. I know that many of the studies that were oral gavage used detergent, uh, tween 20, I believe, um, to make sure that they could actually keep the, uh, the molecule in solution or at least in suspension. Uh, given the tenfold lower solubility of the decanoic, this uh, may explain uh, at a particular receptor, in this case, the one that Dr. Allard mentioned, uh, that there would be uh, significantly less potency because for every squirt that you put in your biological preparation, much less of it will be in solution, uh, predictably anywhere between nine and tenfold less. And things have to be in solution to interact with receptors. Um, so I think uh, that may explain, and, and it may be a trivial explanation. So um, I, I still have tremendous concerns about the in vitro and animal studies, uh, given the uh, disparity between the concentration used in all of these uh, animal studies, both in vitro and in vivo, and the relevant concentrations detected in human beings. But that's, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pessa. Um, we now have time for additional committee discussion. And again, please um, raise your hands if you would like to speak. Dr. Allard? Yeah, I guess I, it's more of a comment than a question. <clears throat> and it's sort of, you know, me thinking through uh, what Dr. Woodruff said about, we may not need a lot of studies, we just need one really high quality study and, and really talking about the NTP study, right? That's what we're all talking about. Um, is that really of all the studies that we've discussed and we've looked at, is that really the one study that, that's left at the end once we use some sort of quality metrics in our minds about studies? Human and animal? No, 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 no. I didn't, I didn't comment on the, on the quality of the epidemiological evidence. Okay. But the other studies, I mean, just thinking about their, <laughs> their dosing, you know, they have pretty... They have an acute exposure at a very high dose. And I would say, I mean, I did look at the at their the methodological features. And some of these studies are very old. I think that also tends to influence, you know, methodological qualities improved over time. But um, I mean, they all of them except for the book staff study said that they randomized. There was uh, it was unclear. Um, about 
the blinding, as Dr. Kaiser has mentioned, they seem to report all their outcome and outcome data. So, but I think it's the IP injection that makes it difficult to really compare it to the other studies that we've been looking at. To me, it was very high and a single dose. So, I don't know, Dr. Luter, what do you think? I, I agree. The IP route with the single high dose, I mean, it's not a relevant route to human exposure and it's, and they're very high doses. So I, I agree with that. That was my assessment as well. Dr. Breton, did you have, you had your hand raised? Yeah, I was just gonna sort of say, but, but it, you, you guys kind of discussed it anyway, but I, I had also, I think it said somewhere in the set of instructions that we had that, you know, a, sing, a single well done study is, can be sufficient evidence for, you know, making a decision. So I, I had, I recall that as well, but I just wanted to clarify, but you already clarified that, yeah, I, the, you weren't talking about the epi studies. No, 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 I'm sorry. I did not mean I to think, say that. No, 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 I know that, and that's fine because I was going to say that, you know, I think that there are, you know, there were several consistent epi studies when it came to the semen parameter, uh, semen quality parameters that showed a consistent effect. Right. I, I didn't. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Dr. Pessa. Uh, I would love to see a study uh, modeled after the NPC study down at about a uh, hundredfold lower dose range. I think that would be extremely important. I mean, I know we don't have that, but it's just a thought. <laughs> oh, I'd agree. Thank you. Are there any other um, comments, questions? Yeah, this is ah, Dr. Hertz with Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I, I think um, one of, as I was looking through those, those epi papers and um, actually comparing the PFNA and PFDA, um, it's in the cases where PFDA does show some effect, it seems, you know, with regard to, I think it's testosterone that, for example, um, <clears throat> it has a weaker effect, although it was significant. But the correlation between PFNA and PFDA was somewhere around 0.8, um, which, me, and, and then in light of, um, of, uh, of Isaac's comment about the solubility and the likelihood that uh, the, the PFDA is actually getting, you know, into the tissues and to the receptors uh, being, being lower. Um, I, I think it, it suggests that there could be a, a quite a bit of confounding and that pr if you were to choose between the two, the PFNA is the more, would be the more plausible of, of the two. Uh, again, it, it doesn't say there can't be compounding effects of more than one, but, uh, but obviously the, the ability to distinguish in an epidemiologic study with that high of a correlation would be um, uh, very, there'd be very weak power to actually distinguish the two. And, and you would expect to see if one of them is actually the the uh, the culprit, <laughs> so to speak, that the other one uh, would would tend to come out looking like it also uh, had an effect. Since these were single, uh, well, these were sing the analyses were of them singly, um, even though the exposure was was concurrent um, in the human studies. So, um, I just putting together, you know, some of this. Um, by you know the chemistry aspect of it with the epidemiology it's it's uh it makes me feel like it's weaker than i otherwise would um might have thought of course with the animal studies we know we don't have that confounding issue of the concomitant dosing that we have with the epi epidemiological studies unavoidably uh, any other comments or questions from the panel? 
All right, not seeing any, um, we can take, uh, move on to public comments, which will be limited to five minutes per speaker. And Dr. Martyr, could you sh please show the public comment housekeeping slide with the URL to the speaker request form? Thank you. So as a reminder, just wanted to let people know that if you would like to make a public comment, please go to the URL that's shown on the screen and fill out a speaker request card. Alternatively, you can click on the Zoom webinar raise hand icon to indicate that you would like to speak. And I'll ask Julian if we have received any speaker request cards. We have not received any speaker request cards. Okay, thank you. Um, is any, do we have any raised hands? Uh, there is in fact one raised hand. All right, um, then it looks like we, that's our one public comment right now. So can we let that person speak or? Uh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, Ms. Hume, I am allowing you to talk. You will need to unmute and you have up to five minutes. Thank you so much for everyone here. <laughs> what a what a grueling process. Um, hats off to, to everyone here. So dear committee, hello, my name is Suzanne Hume. I'm the educational director and founder of cleanearthforkids.org. We ask you to list PFDA as Prop 65 because of reproductive toxicity. Just like P PFNA, studies show PFDA affects developmental toxicity. We're concerned about semen quality, um, PFDA is similar to PF, PFNA, so it can be expected similar results as pointed out. The National Quality Study using the same design, um, same types of rats and housing. We're concerned about sperm quality indicators, lower sperm concentrations, hormones, organ weight. I can go on and on. Um, so we would like you to please um, protect us and add PDF, or I'm sorry, PDF, PDFA to as uh, Prop 65. Um, we also ask that uh, PFAs, uh, PFAs be regulated as a class. Um, how many studies do we need, right? Or we really just need one as stated before. Um, the problem with um, PFAs, obviously, uh, PFAs, is um, the cumulative effects. And when we are looking at these studies in isolation and not looking at cumulative effects and ongoing um, effects, what the, what the public is actually facing, you know, with the products um, we're encountering every day, um, you know, these chemicals in our air, our water, um, our environment, our food, and the fact that we're facing these multiple cumulative exposures on a daily basis, um, we really need to um, we really need to change things and look at these um, in a in a in a um, cumulative way. So I have a, a lot I could say. It's been a really long day, and I apologize. I missed the earlier um, comment. Um, if you had uh, called my name, I'm not sure on PFNA. PFNA. I was called away during your. Um, the last part of your lunch break. But um, I just would like to say thank you so much to everyone today. Um, you know, the whole purpose of having things um, listed as Prop 65 is to protect the public. And um, it's just it's just really so important um, what you're doing. Um, and uh, as you know, these things will help other states and um, you know, the world, so. People look to California and we are looking to you for help. So thank you so much. We ask that you please list a PFDA uh, as Prop 65. Thank you from cleanearthforkids.org. Thank you very much, Ms. Hume. Do we have any other um, requests for comments from the public that have arisen? Speaker request cards or raised hands? There are no other raised hands at this time, Dr. Luterer. Thank you. No speaker request cards as well. All right, thank you very much. Um, next, we'll move on then to the, the committee discussion and um, decision on PFDA and its salts. Um, would any of the committee members like to comment before the vote? I have a question. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I was... I was interested in the this PBBK discussion that we've been having, and 
the data in the document um, show that there there's similar half lives and that PFDA is distributed up throughout the body. It's been measured in brain, lung, and kidney, crosses the blood brain barrier and the placenta and been detected in fetal tissues, cord serum, and breast milk. So I guess I was thinking that that, I, I mean, it's certainly hitting target organs. I guess that's what I'm saying, um, similar to PFDA. So that, that was, um, I just wanted to note that. Thank you, Dr. Woodruff. Any other comments from other panel members? Dr. Breton. I guess I, I would just say I'm struggling a little bit right now because I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about what Irva was, was saying and, and, and thinking about, you know, and not having appreciated the high correlation between the two and at least in the epi studies not being, you know, because so far we haven't seen any studies that have really tried mixtures approaches to which might provide some weight towards you know, one over the other. Um, you know, so so balancing, I guess I'm, this is perhaps not a question, but just a commentary, because I'm just mulling over sort of those last comments and trying to balance that, you know, it, since it seems like, and to some extent, the epi literature is actually some of the stronger literature here than, than the, at the moment than, they, than some of the animal or, or in vitro, unless, yeah, just my comment. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions? before we move on to the vote. Okay, not seeing any, then we, uh, is everyone ready to vote? Anyone not ready to vote? <laughs> okay, all right. I have a question. Yes. That is, um, I, I may need it. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm wondering, um, and I maybe should have asked this earlier in the, in the meeting, uh, but um, we, when we uh, met last year, we put together some kind of priority list. Um, and within the PFAS, um, we had multiple kinds of um, outcomes, reproductive de developmental outcomes. And... Um, I was just uh, what, curious as to the choice of male reproductive toxicity being selected as the one to, to move forward with uh, this year. Uh, and when I looked back over my notes, it wasn't, it didn't seem clear to me that this was for PFNA and PFDA, that this was the, the most uh, whether, I, it wasn't clear whether this was actually the seemed to be the most sensitive or or not um, among the, the the various outcomes that we had looked at last uh, as we did the prioritization. So um, I, and, I can try to address that. This is Martha Sandy. Um, we selected all four of the PFAS chemicals that you prioritized last year, and asked for relevant information from the public on all four. Um, and we, we intend on looking at other endpoints and other chemicals in the coming year. Okay. And we selected these, we you had a fairly short window of time to develop this document. Mm -hmm. And so we selected the male reproductive endpoint and these two chemicals to bring to you this year. Okay. Thank you, both of you, Dr. Sandy and Dr. Herspizioto. Any other comments from anyone? All right, um, then we can move on to the vote. The question before the committee is, has perfluorodecanoic acid or PFDA and its salts been clearly shown through scientifically valid testing according to generally accepted principles to cause male reproductive toxicity. So I'll now call 
each of your names and ask you to vote yes, no, or abstain on this question. So starting off with Dr. Allard. No. Um, Dr. Ayun Kim. No. Dr. Breton. I'm going to abstain. Dr. Hurst-Pizzioto. I'm also going to abstain. Okay. Um, I'm going to vote no. Um, next, Dr. Nazmi. Voting no. Dr. Petsa. No. Dr. Woodruff. I'm going to abstain. All right, so I count three abstain and one, two, three, four, five, no. Um, the staff agree with that tally? Yes. All right. So we have then um, five no votes and three abstain. And that's all we need to say, right? We don't need, there's no requirement for a certain number of no votes and abstain votes, I don't think. That's correct. All right, great. Okay, then thank you everyone. Next, we will move on to the consent item. So this is an update of the California Code of Regulations. Can I, yep. Can I just make a comment about the documents? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just wanna say, I appreciate all the work that goes into this and that I also appreciate that you started to move towards a platform for doing your systematic searches that can be more transparent for us to look at with the Hawk program. And I wanna, I would like to see next year that you use the Hawk program to actually do the data extraction for these studies. I think having us be able to all look at the same data laid out as they do in Hawk, which has been, you know, in, implemented at EPA, National Toxicology Program, and not just ORD, but also in the Office of Water and like their latest PFAS drinking water table would actually be very useful for us and extremely time saving. So we don't have to, we, it'll help us look across all these studies. And I would encourage also that we consider looking at meta-analyses for these studies. I just will reference the PFOA drinking water document that just was released by EPA, which used a systematic review approach and the Hawk data and included a meta-analysis. And then by conducting the meta-analysis, it improved the statistical power to observe effects in the epidemiologic and the animal data. And I probably you've seen this document, but their RFD is set, I think at a lower level than the, than the state of California is at a 1.5 times 10 to the minus nine milligram per kilogram day. And it's based because they were able to do this, this meta-analysis work and the systematic reviews. So I hope that the state of California will take the methods that EPA is using, which the National Academy of Sciences just commented on and improve upon them and make, I think, every much more efficient for everyone and clear to us in the public. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Woodruff. Um, any additional comments? All right. Um, so then we can move on to the update of the California Code of Regulations, Title 27, Section 27000, list of chemicals which have not been adequately tested as required. Um, so as I said, this is a ministerial item and the committee is being asked to affirm changes in response to submissions from the Department of Pesticide Regulation and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. So I'd like to ask OEA Special Assistant for Programs and Legislation, Julian Leichty, for the staff presentation. Thank you, Dr. Luder. Mm -hmm. So this slide indicates the proposed change based on information received from the California Department of Pesticide Regulation, the removal of triethylene glycol, detailed in the staff report provided to the committee. Uh, and I will now turn things back to Dr. Luder. Okay, so again, this is a consent. Um, so I'd like to ask the committee members um, if they are ready to vote or if they have any clarifying questions. Not seeing any. I'm sorry, I may have missed a document. Was there the, that, the DPR document um, 
that's referred to in that previous slide um, for us? Was that sent around and I missed it? The triethylene glycol reported by the DPR. Um, yes, there. It, it was in the the materials provided okay. through the the server. Julian, uh, this is Martha Sandy. You might clarify as to what the document actually was. It's, it's a letter. I don't, Oh uh, yeah, the oh the document itself yes is a is a letter and it's within a a staff report. So just to clarify, Doctor uh, Hertz Picciotta, it's it's a letter received from the California Department of Pesticide Regulation to OEHA, answering our question if if this list needed to be updated. Okay. Okay. And it's in the staff. Report the staff document, the staff report we sent to you. Okay, okay, all right. All right, so does um, any other qu clarifying questions from the panel members? Okay, then we can, um, oops, I'm not sure what that was, but excuse me. <laughs> um, so we can, again, again, I wanna say this is a consent. And so if we're all ready to vote, then I will read the formal question, which is should section 27000 of the title 27 of the California Code of Regulations be amended as indicated in the staff report? And I'll uh, read everyone's name one by one and ask you to vote yes, no, or abstain on this question. Dr. Allard? Yes. Dr. Ayun Kim? Yes. Dr. Breton? Yes. Dr. Hurst Yes. Uh, Dr. Luter, yes. Dr. Nazmi? Yes. Dr. Pesa? Yes. Dr. Woodruff? Yes. All right, so um, everyone voted yes, so that's eight yeses, no noes, and no abstains. All right, then moving on to our next item, which is staff updates. Um, we're going to have staff updates on Proposition 65 listings, regulations, and litigation that have taken place since the last meeting. So again, I'd like to ask Julian Lechte to make a presentation. All right, so since the committee's last meeting, we have administratively added a reproductive toxicity endpoint, developmental toxicity to the listing of bisphenol A. And we have added two chemicals to the Proposition 65 list that's causing cancer. These chemicals are molybdenum trioxide and indium tin oxide. Next slide, please. Uh, I'll now move to the chemicals currently under consideration for administrative listing, which are perfluorooctanoic acid, PFOA, tetrahydrofuran, 2 acrylate, methyl acrylate, and trimethyl propane triacrylate technical grade. Next slide, please. Now turning to safe harbor levels. Since the last meeting, four safe harbor levels have been adopted in regulation. And no significant risk levels were adopted for P, chloro, alpha, 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 trifluorotoluene, dibromoacetic acid, dichloroacetic acid, and trichloroacetic acid. And next slide, please. Uh, we, lastly, we have proposed safe harbor levels for one chemical, 1,3-dichloropropene for the inhalation and oral roots. And now I will turn the presentation to Carol. I don't know if he can see me. I can't see me. <laughs> um, so for other regulatory actions that we're taking currently, um, at your last meeting, I think we mentioned that we were um, uh, in the process of adopting some additional warning methods for alcoholic beverages. And um, we completed that rulemaking and those changes were effective April 1st of this year. Um, we currently have uh, five other um, regulatory actions uh, that are in one, um, sorry, in one level or another of uh, review. The first one being um, an, a regulation we 
have proposed that would set concentration levels for chemicals that are created through cooking or heat processing. And um, our first set of concentration levels are for acrylamide. Um, we have uh, internally completed the, the regulation and submitted it to the Office of Administrative Law for review. And we're hoping to have that um, uh, approved and adopted within the next couple months. Um, we have also developed ta tailored warnings for um, cannabis and THC. There's actually four of them, depending on the way that a person would be exposed. Um, and those are the, the regulatory process is complete on our side, and that has been submitted to the Office of Administrative Law for review also, hopefully to be approved in the next few weeks. Um, we are also in, uh, still in the regulatory process for some changes to what we call the short form safe harbor warnings for um, chemical exposures. The, this was part of our changes to the regulations um, back in um, 2016. We adopted a what we called a short form warning that um, could be used on small packages and parts and things like that. Um, over time, it became clear that that was being used on much larger packages where the full warning could be included. And so we um, have proposed some changes to that regulation that would restrict the amount uh, or the size of a label um, that could use a short form to, um, and currently that's proposed at 12 square inches. And um, also a requirement that we, that the uh, business include the, the name of at least one chemical for which the warning is being given. And there's a slight change in the, the wording of the, of the warning. So um, we are currently in the second um, public comment period. We made some additional changes to the proposal and um, expect the comments to come in by mid-January. And then we can um, hopefully complete the process for that regulation within the next three or four months. Um, the last two are for uh, what we call tailored warnings for uh, exposures to particular chemicals. One is for um, exposures to acrylamide from foods, and it is a um, somewhat a departure from the way that we normally um, um, frame our warnings for um, for Prop 65, but um, it, it's partially in response to some litigation that I'll mention in a couple minutes in the federal courts about First Amendment rights of um, uh, businesses um, when the government is compelling commercial speech. So we're trying to address some of the concerns that the um, appellate courts and the trial courts have identified for these two particular chemicals. Um, Acrylamide uh, is a little bit different in terms of what uh, the concerns are. The argument is that acrylamide hasn't been shown to cause human cancer from any particular food. And so the company shouldn't have to provide a warning at all. Um, we have changed our warning, as I said, to try and address the court's opinions. Um, and we'll see what happens with that, but it has, um, uh, it was developed in response to the litigation. Um, same thing for glyphosate, which is a pesticide um, that you may recall was listed some time ago and has been the subject of litigation for a long time. Um, and we have proposed a, a special tailored warning for consumer product exposures to glyphosate. Again, in response to some concerns that were um, articulated by courts. So next slide. So the two um, cases I had just mentioned um, that are in the federal court are um, the, this National Association of Wheat Growers versus Bonta has to do with glyphosate warnings um, and a First Amendment argument that the warnings should not be required because um, it's only the IARC that has identified the chemical as causing cancer and other agencies, including US EPA, have said it is unlikely to be a human carcinogen. Um, 
and that is uh, on hold currently because we've um, proposed to adopt this special warning and the court is waiting to see if we complete that and then to look at the, the new warning and see if it um, comports with the First Amendment. Same thing with the Cal Chamber versus Bontech case. Um, the, that case is on hold waiting for um, our regulatory process to be completed to see if the proposed warning will um, um, comply with the, what the court feels is needed to, to meet their First Amendment requirements. Um, this, uh, the case of uh, Council for Education Research on Toxics or CERT versus Starbucks has been in the courts for over 10 years. <laughs> and, um, most recently, um, in the trial court, uh, it, you may recall that we had a, um, adopted a regulation um, essentially saying that chemicals that are formed in coffee from the roasting and brewing of coffee don't require a warning under Prop 65 um, because of some very special circumstances in this in, in, that's uh, related to the chemical mixture of coffee. Um, and so our regulation was actually used in this case as a defense um, and was successful. So um, the uh, CERT has appealed that decision to the, um, the court and we have recently filed a brief in that case, uh, amicus brief um, uh, defending our regulation and addressing some other issues. And so we'll see um, what happens in that case, it's still in the Court of Appeal. Um, Physicians for Responsible Medicine, um, this is a, a petition we had to list processed meats, all, all processed meats under Prop 65 as carcinogens. Um, we declined to list and um, so there's a, a case pending in the trial court and we're in the process of negotiating some discovery in that case. So it's pretty early to know how it's gonna come out. Um, we actually resolved one case. <laughs> These take so long. Um, but uh, this one is uh, the American Chemistry Council versus OEHA. Um, many years ago, we had, I think it was in 2015 or earlier, we had listed um, bisphenol A for developmental talk uh, as a developmental toxicant for a few days before we were ordered by the court to take it off the list. Um, we litigated that case all the way up. Um, in fact, the American Chemistry Council asked the um, state Supreme Court to take the case and they declined. And so um, we were able to uh, relist bisphenol A for developmental um, effects. It was already listed for female reproductive effects. So that's our current litigation. Does anybody have any question on either one of those? Oh. Okay, thank you. Questions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I'd next like to ask uh, Dr. OEA Director, Dr. Lauren Zeiss, to summarize the committee actions today. Okay, um, so good afternoon. Um, so the committee found that perfluoro nonanoic acid, PFNA, and its salts has clearly been shown to cause male reproductive toxicity. The vote was six yes, two no, and so PFNA will be added to the Proposition 65 list. The committee declined to add perfluorodecanoic acid and its salts to the Proposition 65 list. It was a vote of uh, five no's and three abstentions. And then the committee unanimously voted on the consent item um, to um, agree to the staff report um, on chemicals which have not been adequately tested as required to move, remove one chemical from the list. Um, and that is, uh, that are, those are the committee decisions. And then just to close, I'd like to um, thank the public for attending the meeting, um, much appreciated. 
Um, we really appreciate it when you uh, come and uh, we also appreciate the input from the public earlier. Um, and then um, I'd like to also thank the committee for your participation in this meeting. Really appreciate the extensive amount of time it takes to prepare for the meeting and then to take time out of your very, very busy schedules to come to the meeting. Uh, really appreciate that. It's really a very great service to the uh, people of California. Um, and uh, so thank you so much for that. And then I'd like to thank the um, uh, staff for all the work to put this meeting on, to put the reports together. Uh, truly um, a, a, a huge amount of effort. So thank you very much to the OES staff. Um, and then finally, I just wanna wish everyone very happy holidays um, and a healthy and safe, um, healthy and safe holidays. Uh, hope you get some time off to relax and catch your breath and wish you all the best. And uh, we'll be seeing you in the new year. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Rika. Thank you, Dr. Zeiss. And I would really like to underscore um, and thank all the hard work that the staff put into putting together these documents for us. Um, it really makes our job that much easier, <laughs> much easier. Um, and I'd also like to wish everyone happy holidays, the, all the staff and also all the committee members and thank everyone for all their hard work. Everyone take care and the meeting is adjourned.